Public Diplomacy Council of America. It is also my privilege to welcome each of you to this webinar featuring Dr. Nancy Snow. We're delighted you're here. The first, it is the first Monday Forum of 2023 co-sponsored by the Public Diplomacy Council of America, as well as the USC Annenberg Center for Communication, Leadership, and Policy. I'm pleased to share that we're exploring a new partnership with the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communications at GW University with the plan to have our very first uh, in-person meeting in March there. I want to say a special thank you to Owen Foster, USC Junior Fellow. He is our tech host today, as well as being the moderator for today's webinar. I also want to say a special thank you to Claudia Del Pozo, the PDCA Hans Tom Tuck Graduate Fellow for serving as backup host and offering the closing remarks to today's webinar. They remind me to urge you to put any questions you may have in the Q&A box. And if you're having any technical difficulties, please use the chat box. Now, I cannot think of anyone better suited to address today's topic, uh, Japanese public diplomacy and the legacy of Shinzo Abe, than Dr. Nancy Snow. Many of you know her. She is a legend in our field and has helped shape the practice and curricula of public diplomacy, literally in universities around the world, including USC, Syracuse. And recently she served as the first full-time public diplomacy professor in Japan when she was the Pax Mundi World Peace Distinguished Professor of Public Diplomacy at Kyoto University uh, of foreign studies. Please check out our website. There's a whole section on Brand Japan. Two of her 16 books focus on Japanese public diplomacy, including her recent book, The Mystery of Japanese of Japan's Information Power. She's been a Fulbrighter twice, has many, many credentials. Uh, and on a personal note, because I'm fortunate enough to teach at the School of International Service at AU, I'm delighted to claim her as an alumna. She did her doctorate there on the Fulbright program. And I discovered we have, um, in fact, studied under some of the same professors, including Dr. Abdul Aziz Saeed. So Nancy, on a professional level, on a personal level, Thank you for being here today, and thank you for all you do to strengthen public diplomacy in general. Nancy, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much, and uh, hello, everybody. I am from not sunny California, Southern California. I used to be living there, but I'm in a cloudy, <laughs> overcast, <laughs> rather chilly, Syracuse, oops, Syracuse, New York. And I have a home here, a gorgeous 1910 American craftsman, my baby, and I'm having a new furnace put in. So hopefully my guys downstairs will behave themselves. I told them they had to be like little church mice between 12 and one. So <laughs> we'll do our best. And, um, you know, as I sat here before we started, and thank you again, Dr. Mueller or Sherry, for your very, very generous uh, introduction. It means a lot to me. Um, I'm a very proud alumna of the School of International Service at AU. And weren't we lucky to work with Abdul Aziz Saeed, uh, one of the greats in our field? I worked with him actually to help establish the masters in. Uh, peace and conflict resolution, uh, but he taught me so much. And when I think about our field of public diplomacy, it really does come down to the human connections, doesn't it, that we make. 
Um, but what I wanted to say earlier is that this date is really uh, quite symbolic to me because it was almost six months ago to the day um, that it was Friday, July 8th, that Shinzo Abe was uh, brutally assassinated by a um, young man who had been in the self-defense forces um, who is now in detainment. We really, in Japan, haven't heard much uh, about what's going to happen to him. He's going under some mental um, sort of study now, uh, of course. And um, But he took out Shinzo Abe, and it's been six months, and I've been reflecting on that. It was even yesterday when I was watching CBS Sunday Morning, and they went back through the the year that they mentioned of uh, the death of Shinzo Abe. And I began with Shinzo Abe to put him in the context of Japan's public diplomacy because my entire deep drilling into public diplomacy, strategic communication in Japan really coincided with Abe's second term. He was Prime Minister 2006 to 2007, very short term, but it was when he returned in December 2012, that was actually when I got the notification of uh, earning my Abe Fellowship. And so by the summer of 2013, I was interviewing people uh, primarily in Tokyo, Japanese, primarily who worked in the area of public diplomacy, academics, government officials, some people in the private sector to get a sense of what is the landscape of PD and, and SC, strategic communications in Japan. And whenever I talked to people, it always sort of came back to Abe because Abe was really the personality that drove a lot of what we have as PD today. And even though he's not with us anymore, his legacy continues. I would argue that a lot of the talk that we hear now, particularly in the arena of security, whether it's economic security or defense, military related security, human security, is coming out of the, the era of Abe. And what difference did Abe make? He was he was really the nation brand face of Japan. So when I think back 10 years uh, since I began this project, a lot of my early writings were looking at Shinzo Abe as the face of Japan in the world for good or for bad, because he was also someone who was somewhat polarizing, more right-wing. Um, he wanted, he didn't want such an investigative press. He liked to control a lot of information, but he also really understood the importance for Japan to become better at its international communication. And it had been rather weak, even into the early 2000s. Japan, if I were, if I had more time, I would go back decades earlier, but um, Japan in the 70s and 80s, the way the world knew Japan was more as an economic power, and it was known more for its products. And so there wasn't really a face of Japan. And I recently wrote about the Japan Foundation and how the Japan Foundation helped to put more of a face onto Japan, particularly in Southeast Asia, where there was a lot of Japanese business involved, but there was some pushback to Japan not really having a personal touch. People really didn't understand Japan. And so the Japan Foundation is part of that early foundation of PD in the 70s, attempted to create more person-to-person -person relations. But if I were to fast forward to Abe's term in the, in the 2000s, he really understood that Japan had to have more of a voice in the world, had to explain itself at the level of foreign policy. It couldn't just um, sort of 
live under the the umbrella, if you will, uh, not just the security umbrella, but the explanation umbrella of the United States, it had to lift up its voice, not only in typical sort of soft power in culture power, but also in political and economic power. And so during the Abe administration, he gave a lot of talks, he traveled around the world, he worked closely with speechwriters, one in particular, Tomohiko Taniguchi is rather legendary in, in our circles in Japan for helping Abe to frame the rhetoric that we know very easily now is the free and open Indo-Pacific. It's, it's this notion of sort of a pushback to the rise of China in Asia to show that not just the US, but the US, Japan and Australia and India and other free and open countries are wanting to um, establish more collaboration, work together in order to have more of a balance of power in the region. So this FOIP idea is attributed to Abe. Another idea really that uh, we still sort of are trying to uh, come into a better mutual understanding today is the notion of womenomics or gender empowerment. Anybody who's uh, in our webinar today, who's familiar with Japan, you're probably familiar with the enormous gender gap. Uh, for a G7 country like Japan, it's, it's really a bit of a, of a stain on its foreign policy that they, ha they haven't had the equality and the equity uh, in the workplace. It's a highly educated society. Men and women are equally highly educated. But when it comes to leadership, particularly in politics and in the so-called C-suite in the private sector, women are relatively missing. So women are much more invisible. And you may remember during the Olympics, there were some remarks made. Japan, we always have these sort of leaders at the top, these figureheads who make sexist remarks and then they have to step down and there's all this sort of chatter online about you know why can't Japan become more sophisticated about this. But it's changing gradually. Abe uh, came up with the, he didn't originate it, it was Kathy Matsui at Goldman Sachs, but he promoted the idea of womenomics. Um, we, we can recall Abenomics, but Womenomics was the idea that we have to have more empowerment of women in the economic sector. And today, earlier today, I was just reading though that uh, Japan still struggles with how to get more women in the workplace at the same time that it has to deal with the low fertility numbers. So there are a lot of women those who are highly educated, some who are putting off marriage, putting off childbirth, and they want to have a career, and it's very hard to balance it all. What we have often said, or we ask ourselves, can you have it all? And uh, they're they're asking the same, especially you know younger men and women in Japan. But back to Abe, Abe was the voice of Japan, but at the same time that he took so much attention in terms of communicating to the world, reaching out to the world, traveling around. He's credited with getting the Tokyo Olympics. At the same time, when we look at public diplomacy, it raises the question of if you have this figurehead, this personality who is driving a lot of your public diplomacy, what happens then to the institutions that go unsung there, or don't really uh, feel the sense of urgency of communicating with the world. And by that, I mean an NHK, for instance. Um, I recently completed a paper uh, looking at Japan's strategic communications and public diplomacy, and I had to map out different areas in our field. And the weak link in Japan has been in international broadcasting. Um, ask yourself how often you come across 
uh, news broadcasting out of Japan. NHK is modeled on the BBC. And yet I've met with NHK many times over the years with their executives to talk to them about the public diplomacy mission of NHK, because it's very much set up uh, and funded in a way that's similar to the BBC, but it doesn't have that affiliation with the um, with the culture or the country as much as it should have as a, as a public diplomacy vehicle. But NHK and NHK World, which is the English language version of NHK, it's still it's it's highly funded, but it has a very limited footprint in the world. And it has a board of directors uh, affiliated with the government and some of the controversy over the years as I was studying brand Japan was that NHK was too closely aligned with the Japanese government, i.e. the LDP and the Abe administration. So it was sort of keeping itself in line with the agenda of the Abe administration. And you certainly don't want that. You wanna have a free and independent media. And I know a lot of great people who work at NHK and who really espouse that attitude and philosophy but they felt that they were under really the shadow of a, of a board that is often seen as sort of following in line with the administration. So again, back to Abe, the question is now with Abe being gone, what happens to Japan's public diplomacy? And I'm going to make a prediction here because uh, I really think what we're gonna see, Japan is going through a lot right now. Economically, the Japanese yen is weakened. Uh, the Tokyo Olympics were, I guess, on measure a success. I really, in my in my advocacy there as a, as an international speaker and and talking a lot about the Olympics, I was very worried about the Olympics taking place, and I wasn't alone in that. And of course, this is at the time when Jet. Japan really didn't have itself highly vaccinated for COVID. But in the end, the, the Olympics took place. And yet now, even with the Olympics, you may have heard that there is controversy that's come out of that with corruption charges. And this will be a story that will continue to grow, that will put a taint even on the postponed Tokyo 2020 Olympics. But back to, again, post-Abe, and living under the Abe legacy, where does that lead? Uh, leave the current administration, the Kashida administration? I think a lot will be determined, frankly, by this major event that's upcoming in a few months, which is the G7 in Hiroshima, Japan. You couldn't get more powerfully symbolic for Japan at a time when Japan is really lifting up its voice, Kushida in particular, on the security stage. So public diplomacy is increasingly getting integrated with strategic communications. STRATCOM, I should add, I learned in doing my paper, I had to really go out and understand that STRATCOM in Japan is really sidelined from PD. It is under the Ministry of Defense, the National Security uh, Council. It's not really part of the regular discourse in Japan. And it is just a few people who refer to STRATCOM and it, it doesn't have the level of discussion that we would have here in the United States. So what I'm going to, uh, what I predict is that by the G7 you will see an event that will be partially really an opportunity for uh showing Japan in in the light of post Abe a new administration going forward as a global leader taking on more responsibility but also you can't help but with the staging of that in Hiroshima to have a reflection on where the country 
has come from, you know, in the past. And there is going to be a quandary where I think the PD uh, element from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from the Japan Foundation, from the Foreign Press Center of Japan, the different institutions involved, they're going to have to explain this rise of Japan in the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis its military. You may have also heard that there has been an announcement of an increase in defense spending over five years of 2%. That may not sound like much, but we know Japan's constitution and to many people around the world, it is referred to as the peace constitution and the society and the nation as a whole is seen as a pacifist nation. But the reality is Japan is a formidable military. It's just not an offensive, I, I, I should, <laughs> it's not on the offense, I should say. It's for defense purposes only. And so now with Japan announcing we're gonna, we're gonna increase the defense expenditures, that is going to signal to Japan's detractors that Japan is sort of rekindling its past perhaps. And the Japanese government is going to have to address it. It's already doing that. There's already a great deal of interest in this aspect to Japan because most of the world still views Japan in terms of soft power, kawaii culture, pop culture, a mix of traditional with modern. It's seen as very nonviolent and in terms of personal safety and security, it is a very nonviolent country. But now with this defense expenditure, it's going to have to explain itself differently. And you know, in terms of how we view public diplomacy, and we, we go by different models, but we often begin with listening and doing our research and understanding. The Japanese are very, very gifted at listening and contemplating and taking that in. That, that's highly valued in an educational environment. But what is less valued and what is less practiced is the advocacy, is the explaining and especially explaining if there's conflict, if there's a difference of opinion, that's often something for which many Japanese are, are really ill-prepared to explain. So that's why I think Abe was so effective as a leader, as the nation brand face of Japan, because he took on his detractors. He, he wasn't shy at all about taking on uh, those who would criticize him. And he had many critics, not only within the diet, uh, within government, but also outside of the government. And he, of course, aligned himself closely with the Trump administration. He was the first prime minister to go visit Trump when he was the president-elect. And they got along very well, and Trump visited. And so there was this closeness there. So if you were a Trump critic, you were likely an Abe critic. But now without Abe, with Kushida, he's less of a face of Japan, I would argue, even though I advise the Japanese government now. And I think, and he's from Hiroshima. And so of course he'll be presiding over his ancestral home, his, uh, which is very significant in in Japanese culture. And yet Kushida doesn't have quite that force of personality that Abe had. He's a little bit more uh, passive, but at the same time though, his agenda is just as full as Abe's was. And he was an acolyte of Abe, but now he's trying to figure out how can he come out from under this, this legacy really that, that Abe still has today. I need to add with the Abe legacy, because it's been well documented, that there at the time of Abe's death, uh, of course, it was a major shock. And I, I did a lot of media. I happened to be in New York at the time. And um, I did 
about over 17 hours, did 15 interviews, just one after another. And I really did that on the spot because of my feelings for Japan, my affection for Japan, and knowing what a formidable figure in history Abe was. And at the time when I first got notified, I think it was CNN that reached out. My feeling was that he wasn't going to make it. In fact, I think he was probably mortally wounded uh, from the start, but the announcement of his death wasn't until about five hours later. But at that moment, I thought this is going to, um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because as I said, he was a he was a controversial figure at times. But what happened is that very shortly after his death, the uh, unification church controversy really came into the foreground. And then if you recall, Abe's uh, state funeral was put off until late into September. And it was after all of this talk about the unification church, the church had a very close tie with the liberal democratic party, Abe's party over decades and was a major contributor. And this was more of a shock, uh, one could say, this unification church controversy, or was an equal shock, I could argue, as Abe's death. I mean, I've talked to many Japanese who were just flabbergasted at the linkage between the unification church and the LDP. And this, frankly, surprised me because I thought that this would be in a way kind of like a JFK moment for Japan, but it turned into sort of like lifting a lid off of all of the pay payola that goes back and forth in politics. And it sort of really brought to the attention of the Japanese people that politics is a very dirty business. And so as a result, it had an impact then on Abe's legacy when you talk to many Japanese, then and it in turn has impacted Kushida because his numbers at the time in June when he attended the NATO meeting and the G7 and he was on his uh, diplomacy tour around the world, his numbers were very high in the 60s, in the mid to upper 60s. And now he's uh, about under 30%. So it dropped in half very precipitously following the death of Abe and mostly due to the unification church controversy, particularly the way that Kushida handled it. He tried to apologize for it and he's had several ministers uh, resign over it, but it has really taken away from this sort of smooth transition because Kushida's only been in office uh, since the fall of 2021. So again, going forward, what would be Japan's message to the world? I mean, you know, in, in terms of public diplomacy, we, we talk about information, but also persuasion. It's along a continuum. And I think Japan will have to thread that needle very carefully now as it takes on a renewed agenda in security. And it is, there's just no going back in this arena. I think that the Japanese people, I often in my writing say that you can't make any major turn in policy in Japan if you don't explain it to the Japanese people, if you don't have them on board. So I think that right now the Japanese government is doing a pretty good job of explaining its foreign policy agenda to the world. But where I think it still has a long way to go is to get the public engaged in not just what its own foreign policy agenda is, but in terms of showing the world that this is a very active a uh, democracy that has a lot of circulation of ideas and there's a feedback loop to the government. It's not, it doesn't really look that way when I'm there in Japan. Uh, it, it often startles people, in fact, when they visit Japan 
at how little people talk about politics. You rarely, if ever, are going to hear anybody talk about politics <laughs> in Japan because that is just not of interest to people. And part of that is because the LDP has dominated for so long. And um, it goes back to the 1950s. So it's been almost like one party that's dominated. So it's not really that engaging. So what people do engage on, and this is what has led to Japan showing up in the top 10 lists of all the superpower cultures around the world, is that we engage on cultural things. We engage on you know, talking about uh, temples and architecture and um, sensibility in, in the arts and culture. And so that is something that everybody can have something to say about. And also it doesn't really lead to anything controversial where there's debate and where there might be a different point of view and people will feel uncomfortable. So, um, I have a lot more to say, but I want to stop here. I just looked at my watch and I want to open it up to Q&A because I know I've been talking about Abe and a little bit about Japan's PD and SC. So I'll welcome Nick's first question. Thanks, Nan. And it's uh, great to see you. And I should say that uh, at USC, we were very proud that Abe was a uh, alum of uh, USC and he would come and visit us on, on campus. But in, in that regard, he was quite unusual because uh, Japan has quite low rates of uh, foreign study. And where I, I want you to want to lead discussion maybe, as you, as you know, I uh, talk a lot about reputational security. And that's an idea that uh, public diplomacy isn't only about telling about telling people about the good things that you do, that your society provides, uh, but also eliminating the bad things. And uh, so I wonder if you could talk about how does Japan uh, eliminate or reduce the negative trends in its international engagement? Uh, you know, there seems to be a rise in an inward looking disposition. Uh, I looked the other day and Japan was ranked 80th in terms of English language ability, and it's not much better at other foreign languages. Uh, it, it's 50th in the world in terms of acceptance of refugees. And uh, so it's a, in all of these numbers, it's a complete outlier um, compared to other countries with its wealth. And yet, um, right now, it's number two in the Anhalt Index uh, in terms of um, strength of its brand. But do you think that a strong brand can be um, expected going forward when it has these sort of structural weaknesses? And what can Japan do to eliminate those, uh, those structural weaknesses? Because when I've talked to Japanese diplomats, their emphasis is always on telling people how wonderful they are, not actually making sure that they can sustain that wonderfulness uh, going forward. Well, I mean, you're really raising what I was sort of getting into a bit, which is that threading that needle going forward. I think that Japan is entering a very complicated period here because there's going to be a lot more expected of Japan. And, you know, it troubles me. I'm not sharing with you all all of the discussions and the frustration that I live with. I mean, I love Japan. I love living there. But in terms of, yeah, it, it's not all just sort of, aren't we doing well and let's hope nothing bad happens. You know, you've got to really plan for tomorrow. And it's, it's, there are just so many announcements being made, even in the last year. If you looked at, uh, it surprised me that Japan was so quick to respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Almost, uh, usually Japan sort of waits, but it was out there and it had, uh, went very public with what it was providing in its own capacity, uh, protecting the Ukrainians in their battle against Russia. But um, it can't just exist on global goodwill, because I think that 
I think that Japan is very fortunate to be a country where people have sort of a, a good feeling about it. It's often at the top of everybody's bucket list in terms of, you know, I want to travel to this country because it's different from my own co home country. But by the same token, like you say, Nick, it's very troublesome that fewer and fewer young people from Japan are going abroad. And I've talked to them over the years about that. And it's because they're, they're comfortable at home. They're comfortable in their own language. They're comfortable with their own cuisine. And they worry about having to find, in, in some instances, Japanese cuisine abroad. Will it be at the same quality? So when you have that, that sort of lack of- That wasn't the worry leaving Britain. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you're raising such a critical question of, what is it doing outside of the global goodwill? And I would argue, I mentioned these unsung organizations. One that I've worked with a bit is JICA, which is the International Cooperation Agency, almost like a USAID. And JICA really, you could argue, does a lot of good work, but has done foundational work, similar to the Japan Foundation. Um, and I mentioned Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia at a time in, in the 70s was so anti-Japan. And, and it wasn't just Southeast Asia, but other parts. There was sort of uh, a lack of really being able to identify with the Japanese. They were seen as almost too foreign to other people, and yet they made good products and so on. And so the, the Japan Foundation today, the majority of its offices uh, are located in Southeast Asia. They, they really put a focus on that and they figured out a way, it wasn't going to be just let us introduce ourselves to uh, from Japan to the rest of Asia, because to some Japanese, Asia is different from Japan, but of course, Japan's part of Asia. But the um, JF in the early days said, we want to introduce Southeast Asian art and culture and people to Japan, because the Japanese people have to understand that we, we're not the be all and end all uh of uh sort of high culture that uh, there are many uh, aspects to asia many parts of asia where we have a lot to learn and so this two-way uh collaboration existed and so now a lot of the arts exchanges it's not just displaying the work of artists from a place but they're collaborative pieces and so something like that over time over the years has led in part to building up a, a reliability partner reputation for Japan and Southeast Asia. And I think that really came about from talking to my JF friends. They said, we went in there, we had to go in with a lot of humility and with our listening ears and with our interest, our real authentic interest in wanting to learn from them because they felt like they weren't being listened to. They felt like they were just a place where we could invest or we could send development assistance. And so they were able to understand that over time. Now that is a reputation supply from which you can build on today going forward because Japan has, it, has its hands full now in the security even though I would put reputation security in part of that, but when I say security and military, taking on China and all China's activities in the in in the South China Sea and in along you know outside the Taiwan Strait, so um, that is a part where I think there's some value and also JICA recently hosted the eighth iteration of the Tokyo International Conference on African Development. Now, again, in the scheme of things, there's a lot more to do, but this, this iteration in Tunisia in August that didn't really get much attention internationally, it 
came about, uh, TCAD originated in 1993. So it's almost, it's been almost 30 years that JICA has been heavily involved in Africa, but has had these regular uh, meetings. And when you talk to the people who go back and forth, you get these stories that are so uplifting about working on it at the agricultural level, working with people uh, in villages and in many uh, parts of Africa in a partnership style. So it's not, it, it's something that I think they really carried over from their Southeast Asian experience. But we just don't hear about it because these are not the stories that are really cast as part of Japan's global voice. And I think when you compare Japan to China, because anybody who tracks me, GPS, <laughs> I was in Beijing from August through early November. And the comparison is just incredible because China really speaks with a global voice, as we know. China is so active in Africa and China really acknowledges, brings to light all that it's doing that Japan doesn't. It's still, Japan almost feels like it doesn't want to promote what it's doing. And I'm always asking JICA and JF that, you know, how can I help you or others help you to communicate what you're doing? Because this in turn would incite young people to want to go abroad. I really believe that. I, I mean, a lot of the work I do is very faith-based. You know, it's this belief that if they could see what these people have been put in, putting in place over decades, they would have an interest then in making a difference. Because interestingly, with study abroad, the participation, it's overwhelmingly female. And those women often go into the international arena they end up in agencies like JICA and JF because of that experience living abroad. So these sort of, there's this sort of kind of these circular points of uh, influence that take place. But yeah, we can't just exist on global goodwill and being on these top 10 lists of places that people want to visit because I've met the people who come to Japan, speaking of the English gap, and many, you know, some at conferences and Europeans uh, who talked to me and said, you know, I came to Tokyo expecting, I mean, this city of 35 million, I don't speak Japanese. I thought in my international hotel, the concierge, you know, would be able to communicate with me. And it's sometimes, it's disappointing enough that you'll hear them say, I'm glad I visited, but probably coming so far to Asia, I'd go somewhere where I can get around better. And so that's a loss too. But um, you know, there's still uh, this talk to uh, relinquish the gap, but go to world-class universities in China and listen to Chinese speaking almost like native English speakers and that will jolt you into a higher consciousness <laughs> to get Japan on a faster track. So thank you. It's a very sophisticated question you had and not a very sophisticated answer, but. <laughs> Great, um, yeah, we'll move on to Bill uh, when there's questions next. And then we'll, after that, we'll move on to some questions from the chat. Thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Snow. That was a, a fascinating presentation. It's really, uh, really useful to get that kind of contemporary information from somebody who's so close to what's what's happening on the ground. Um, your presentation raised a number of questions, or questions not exactly, but issues I, I wanted to follow up on. I'll try to weave them all into one question. Um, you had mentioned that. Uh, uh, Premier Kishida has uh, is going is calling for an ex for more defense spending. Uh, you've also mentioned in a, another context that uh, that the uh, greatest challenge to Japan's strategic communications is is the general public. Mm -hmm. One reason being that they're not much interested in hearing about um, 
uh, defense military issues uh, that involve Japan because they they're very comfortable in your in the um, uh, Pacific or pacifistic I suppose uh, place that they are now uh, North Korea and China are becoming much more belligerent lately uh, and I, I can imagine that's causing some concern in in Japan is that um, do you think the public is ready for a new message in uh, uh, on defense spending and, and defense activities on the part of the Japanese government. Oh, indeed. And not only that, but as this plays out, Kushida made the announcement, but then said it would happen really, it, it, it wasn't going to happen overnight because they don't know how to pay for it. And they don't know if they're going to put the onus on corporations, probably not. Uh, a sales tax would really not go over well either. So, um, so that's why it's not going to happen until within this five-year period. So it's like make the big announcement, but then deal with the particulars. You know, we're going to put off the particulars. But I think that gets at the heart of the problem, doesn't it? Because the public. Coming out of this unification church controversy, the public has found its domestic voice. It really surprised me. Now, they're not taking to the streets the way that they did in a limited way uh, back in 2015, 2016, when Abe was proposing changes to Japan's peace constitution. He got most of the changes he wanted. Uh, there, there hasn't been a dismantling of Article 9, but Article 9, they've been able to get around a lot of it uh, over the years as, as it is. So I think the, the public um, going forward could be a real problem for the administration, uh, even though at the heart of it, having this problem, I think, can be good for Japan to have this sort of awakening that you've been getting by as a government with people who were rather passe toward politics. And because of the unification church, Achilles heel, um, that has now made it really more difficult going forward to, to just make pronouncements and expect people to go along with that. And the reason I say that is because Japan is a place that has, in its economic rise, created a class of people, a majority who think of themselves as middle class, as living well. But there's definitely this rise in suffering, and we see a rise in global suffering. But disproportionately in Japan, because this is a country that has really viewed itself as very affluent. But because of now with the weakening of the end, it's not just that. Even in um, the jobs market for uh, women, all this push of women going into the job sector, well, the women already occupy the part-time jobs, the jobs with no benefits. And so there, there's just a lot more sort of grumbling about you know what are you what have you done for me lately or what are you going to do for me lately and one thing that people have been able to hold on to with a lot of sentimentality is that peace image that Japan is a peaceful country a beautiful people they've lived with this for 70 over 70 years how do you change that where you don't want to put the japanese people in a position of having to explain this defense rise, you know, they, many of them don't even want to address that. It's just not even in their realm of understanding. And so I think the government is going to have to have this um, information campaign domestically uh, first, really, uh, or maybe in concert with its global uh, communication. And it hasn't done that because it just doesn't have the history of really communicating much with the Japanese people. With Kushida, let me just add too, he also wants to restart the nuclear power 
So you're adding even more to this because that's what people did take to the streets over. Of course, it was within a few, it was in the first couple of years after 311. But at that time, nobody wanted, they, they took all the nuclear power plants offline. Well, now because of the energy crisis, uh, Kushida's pushing that. He's also pushing, you know, a world without nuclear weapons. I mean, he, he's got the biggest plate I've seen. And, um, and so you just cannot take the public for granted. And that is something that I've really noticed in the last year or so. I think it really began with a lot of uh, more public protest over the Olympics. And that was something that that impacted Abe's uh, legacy too. You know, he did not uh, preside over the Olympics. He resigned before the Olympics took place. Thank you for your question and your comments. I appreciate it. Fantastic. Um, we will now move on to questions coming from the uh, the chat and the Q and A feature. So if you have more of those, feel free to put them in. Uh, this first question comes from uh, Ambassador Greta Morris, uh, who asks, has Japan used public diplomacy to try to improve its relations with Korea? How would you compare Japanese public diplomacy to Korean public diplomacy? Well, I've done quite a bit of work in Korea. I'm glad you asked about that. I think Korea is further along in Japan. And part of it is, when I say further along, they invest more in public diplomacy. They also have very public events, uh, the public diplomacy forums. Uh, they had a kickoff first public diplomacy forum in 2017, and it was held at a big shopping mall and they, they had a big banner out front. And so they were really sort of drawing in uh, the public or at least sort of advertising uh, public diplomacy on behalf of the government. And I think Korea being located as it is between China and Japan, it has really gotten more of its uh, pop figures involved, uh, its films, and it's, it's sort of like Japan may have been years ago with a lot of emphasis on popular culture, but it's now doing more to explain itself as playing a mediator role as having a role in not being uh, the, you know, the second largest democratic or market economy in the world, but a rising power that has uh, an ability to collaborate with Japan and wants to collaborate more. Now there, ha there are historical issues that have really been ongoing uh, bones of contention between Korea and Japan. But I think those are slowly being overcome. And the latest, uh, the administration, the new administration in Korea is interested in working closer uh, with the Kushida administration. But I think Korea's difference is having more of an investment, higher investment. Um, they have a very active uh, public broadcasting there. Ari Rong TV and, and radio and you know I've participated in that, but they have a they have a lot more of the Korean students, even at the university level, engaged in public diplomacy. And frankly, where I've worked with Korea is more in exchanges. Uh, they have a very, very popular exchange program, a, a Korean scholarship program. Japan has a scholarship program too. But I think Korea looks at it more in the light of Korea's voice and explaining Korea and what we did. I worked with uh, Kadir, uh, um, you may know Dr. Uh, uh, Yoon, who, uh, who's now just announced he's got a Fulbright to GWU next year. Uh, he and I worked over three years and we did a survey of alumni of that uh, Global Korea Scholarship Program. And many of those Korean students, they were either living in Korea, but they were still very involved and engaged with Korea. I mean, it wasn't, you know, 100%, but it was the fact that they were even being asked about their experience that really meant a lot to them. And that type of survey research 
as far as I know, is not taking place in Japan. So there's still sort of this gap, this knowledge gap about public diplomacy. It doesn't really have the level of awareness that a smaller country like Korea has, South Korea. Uh, and so on a similar note, and what looks like will be our last question for time's sake, uh, comes from Brad Minnick, is about relationships between the United States and Japan and public diplomacy, specifically what impacts that a more isolationist House of Representatives in the U.S. might have on U.S.-Japan relationships, um, and also you know, the role of uh, the United States' as public diplomacy within Japan. Well, I mean, look, U.S. and Japan, and again, this is what I wrote about in this paper recently, they, they're as close as they've ever been, and they're getting closer uh, because of, again, China's rise, if you want to call it great power competition. Um, you know, I, I think that it's just going to get closer and I can't really speak to the partisanship in Congress other than to say that I think the Republicans and the Democrats are very concerned about China's growing influence, having this hegemonic influence in Asia and overpowering uh, the US-Japan alliance. And so US and Japan are becoming closer all the time. I thought they couldn't get closer than when Abe was in office, especially his longer second term. But it's even closer now because of the realities of the security concerns, cybersecurity, the lack of really having a collaborative message coming from US and Japan beyond the military. And I think that Public diplomacy, as I said earlier in my opening remarks, is going to have to address this rhetoric of security. It's not something, defense and security, that PD has historically done, much less in Japan. It's really been isolated. And I mentioned that STRATCOM is very isolated in Japan from people who work in public diplomacy. But I think going forward, you will see these two countries working together, showing up in uh, conferences together, and really having more joint um, missions beyond just the military, uh, really out of reality, the reality of living there and seeing China uh, really have the kind of influence that it has all over Asia, but especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, that growing concern has really drawn these countries closer together. Well, thank you for those really uh, thoughtful answers there, Dr. Snow. I will now hand it over to Claudia um, for our closing remarks on the day. Thank you, Owen. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Snow, for all that you've shared with us. It's been really interesting, uh, especially for me as a current student of public diplomacy. It's really great to hear from anybody's experience. Um, so yeah, just to conclude, uh, this concludes our January 9th, first Monday forum on Japanese public diplomacy and the legacy of Shinzo Abe. Uh, again, thank you so much to Dr. Nancy Snow for being here and sharing about her experience and all the knowledge that she's gained. Um, Dr. Snow, you made a lot of excellent points, but what really stuck out to me the most uh, was this one quote you made, um, which is that you just cannot take the public for granted. Um, that's an excellent point. And, you know, it really hits in on the, the public part of public diplomacy. Um, it's not just about engaging foreign audiences, but domestic ones too. And I just think it really hammers home also the point that public diplomacy is so multifaceted. It's never just about exchange. It's not just about strategic communications. It's not just about branding. Um, in order for it to be effective, you really have to engage all of those different angles, and you really showed that in your um, in your talk today. So thank you. You're very uh, welcome. Yes. So uh, we also want to thank um, all of our audience here today for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you taking some time out of your day for this um, important topic, and we hope that you'll join us for the next First Monday Forum on February 6th where we'll be joined by uh, Christopher Teal for a viewing of his original documentary entitled A Diplomat of Consequence, 
Ebenezer D. Bassett, America's first black diplomat. Uh, Mr. Till is a member of the Senior Foreign Service and the current Public Diplomacy Fellow at George Washington University, not to mention a past recipient of a PDAA award. Uh, we're very much looking forward to this special program next month and to the opportunity to honor America's first black diplomat during Black History Month. Um, event details and registration information are going to be shared in upcoming weekly updates, so be sure to check your inbox on Sundays for that. Um, and the uh, details will also be shared on the events page of the PDCA website. That's uh, publicdiplomacy.org for anyone who needed that. So once again, thank you all for your participation and for your excellent questions. Um, a recording of this uh, First Monday Forum will appear on our YouTube channel uh, within the coming days. And we really hope to see you next time and wish you a productive day. Thank you. Thank you.